thanks for letting me be part of what I think is just an exciting season for you. I, I, I hope you can sense that there's a sort of tangible sense of kind of new season that God is making all things new, and it's been an honor and a treat for me to be part of that. I want to finish with a sending message for you uh, and a message of hope. And uh, the way I want to do that is by thinking about the nature of the context in which you are being sent as God's ambassadors. And the way I want to do that is to try to think a little bit more carefully be, uh, carefully about what it means. And I haven't been drinking this weekend. I don't know what everybody else is doing. Um, I want to think a little more carefully about what it means to say we live in a secular age. And I actually want that to sound, at the end of this, my goal is at 9.30, you will think that that is a world of opportunity, not threat. So what does it mean that we live in a secular society? And what should be our posture then as the people of God amidst a secular age? Should, should we have a posture of sort of defending ourselves against threat? Or should we be open to opportunity? This morning, I want to suggest to you that, in fact, the secular might not be what you think. <laughs> and it's certainly not what most of the op-ed pages are telling us. That the secular is something much more complex and messy and uh, uh, um, contested. And that I think that there are very, very unique opportunities for the body of Christ in this moment. I think it is a very exciting time to be the church. I think it's especially exciting to be a church who brings the good news in a place like Berkeley. I think the season of openings is beginning, and I think that it's important that we be prepared to be the people who come ready to share that good news. Because the secular, see, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to contest, there's just this sort of tired trope and narrative that imagines secularism as this great behemoth beast that is here to eat our children. And so we need to then retreat to our enclaves or run to the hills or whatever it might be. Now, I don't deny that something has changed, and I don't deny that secularity doesn't come with its own challenges, but I actually think if we are going to properly understand the challenges, we need to properly assess what is the nature of the secular and a secular age in which we find ourselves. And I think one of the best ways to capture that it comes from a British novelist by the name of Julian Barnes. Does anybody read Julian Barnes? We don't, yeah. So he's not read very much on this side of the pond. And he is like one of the greatest novelists of his generation. Barnes is, um, Barnes is in many ways, I just want to set the context here. Julian Barnes is kind of like the poster child of English, British secularization. He comes from that generation that is so thoroughly post-Christian that he has absolutely zero religious experience or formation at all. Okay? So he really is the product of a post-Christian generation. Remarkable novice, novelist and critic. In 2008, he wrote a really wonderful memoir called Nothing to be Frightened of, which I really commend to you. And in that uh, memoir, there are two places where he says this line, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. If you want to know what it's actually like to live and inhabit a secular age, that's what it feels like. It's not Richard Dawkins. It's not the new atheist. It's not this sort of confident naturalism that thinks it's got the whole world figured out. That is a minority report. The majority report of the messy complexity of a secular age is when Julian Barnes says, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Or you can look for these kinds of openings and opportunities, these, these longings that still sort of endure in our culture. You'll find it in music. I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. Now, this is, I'm 48 years old, so what I'm going to quote to you is a bunch of music from Seattle from the 1990s. It's just <laughs> the way it goes. Um, I will say, I think you can listen to, uh, um, in, in interesting ways, Kanye's work 
shows symbols and signs of this. I think Chance the Rapper is a very, very interesting phenomenon. Um, so I think there's all kinds of places musically. I'm just, I'm gonna talk to you from dad rock world, okay? <laughs> the Postal Service, almost everything that Ben Gibbard is actually attesting to what I'm talking about. And some of you will recognize the lyrics from the Postal Service song, Clark Gable, in which he sings, I want so badly to believe that there is truth and love is real. And I want life in every word to the extent that it's absurd. I want you to hear the want. The way to understand what's going on in a secular age is to understand what is it that people still want. I'm less interested in what they believe. <laughs> I don't believe in God but I miss him. That tells me something that you still want. I want so badly to believe that there is truth and love is real. Or on that same album, in a later song, you hear, I'm looking through the glass where the light bends at the cracks, and I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, pretending the echoes belong to someone, someone I used to know. One of the features of a secular age is actually a deep nostalgia, a longing for something that feels lost. In many ways, the entire filmography of Wes Anderson is about this as well. I I'm giving you like quintessential white guy, hipster nonsense this morning, but that's ju I'm just coming from my context. <laughs> See, what I think should interest all of us if we really want to understand missionally what it means to be embedded in a secular age, what should interest us is all of the ways that our secular age still seems haunted. It's haunted. I want this. I miss this. I long for this. I'm going to call these openings cracks in the secular. And I want us to know what does it look like for us to be attuned to the cracks in the secular. Now, to say that the secular is still haunted, that it's still characterized by these longings, these wants, does that mean that we're not secular? No, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm not pretending like, oh, no, actually, everything is still hunky-dory and everything's the same as it was for 2,000 years. That's not true at all. But it does mean that secularity is not what we thought it was. Secularity is not actually the Enlightenment narrative tale that we are sold, it turns out to be that story does not make sense of people's experience. If Richard Dawkins was right, there would be fewer and fewer people saying, I want so badly to believe that there is truth and love is real. <laughs> but they are. Or, or just take it simply this way. How many people do you know that tell you, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual? spiritual. <laughs> now, it's very easy for Christians to get kind of judgy when people say that, you're like, oh, that's so mushy. Listen, that's an opening. There's a crack in the secular. They're not saying, I'm not religious, but I am a dyed-in-the-wool naturalist, and I think we are just meat encased like sausages until we die. <laughs> they don't say that. They're like, there has to be something more to this going on. Steve Jobs said he was 50-50 on believing whether God existed and whether immortality was real. I think if you live in San Francisco and somebody says they're 50-50 on whether God exists, you should take that bet. <laughs> That's a really, really interesting opening and opportunity. So the secular is not synonymous with unbelief. The secular is not synonymous with unbelief or a-religiosity, and it is certainly not synonymous with atheism. Instead, what I want us to realize is what characterizes a secular age is the contestability of all belief, okay? So it's not synonymous with non-believing, but it is, what does it mean to live in a secular age? It means to live in an age in which the plausibility structures have shifted. Do you know what I mean by plausibility structures? Plausibility structures are what is believable for us. So Charles Taylor, a great Canadian philosopher, great because he's a Canadian philosopher, um, <laughs> wrote this mammoth 900-page tome called A Secular Age, of which I am ripping off 90% of this. Um, and what Taylor says is, the, the key question to ask ourselves in the West, 
So this is a determinate contingent history. How did we go from a moment in the year 1500 in which it was virtually impossible to not believe in God to the year 2000 in Berkeley, California, where for many of those most influential elites, it's virtually impossible to imagine believing in God? The difference in those years is not whether or not people actually believe in God or don't. The question is, what is it possible for them to believe? What seems plausible? What's the set of conditions that make things believable? What it means for us to live in a secular age is that we live in an age in which belief is contested and contestable. No one can take their beliefs to be axiomatic. Nobody can take their beliefs to be the default which is actually one of the reasons why dogmatic secularism is insufficiently secular. But we, that's a free footnote. We can talk about that later. <laughs> so secularity does not end belief. Instead, it generates this situation of contested and contestable belief. And Taylor names this sort of situation as one of what he calls, I think very helpfully, cross-pressure. He says, we all live, to live in a secular age is to live in this sort of cross-pressured situation where we all feel the pull and tug and push and, and uh, uh, challenge and nudges of alternative ways of believing. Does that sound like the world that you live in? Yeah. It sounds like my world, right? So that what's going on is in this cross-pressured space, on my street, there are 10 different people who believe 10 different things, and we all get along, and I can imagine the possibility of living that life. So this cross-pressured situation means not that people stop believing. In some ways, what Taylor says is it creates almost this like pressure cooker, and you get this explosion of a thousand different ways of believing the multiplication of different ways of believing. If that doesn't describe San Francisco, I don't know what does. So I think there are some important implications of this. First, it means that, and again, this is Taylor's term, belief is fragilized, he says. Belief is fragilized. Now, what does he mean? What he means is, look, even... As a believer in the resurrection of Jesus Christ in a secular age, I am cross-pressured by all of the accounts that make me wonder if it's true. As a believer that God has created us in his image, I am also haunted by all the possibilities of how else we might explain what it is to be human. I think it is a virtue of faith in a secular age to be honest that doubt is a companion, not an enemy, okay? In, in a secular age, we are all Thomas at different moments and seasons, and God is not afraid of that reality. It's why he gave us the Psalms, Okay? So I think one of the first implications is that in a secular age, we need to realize that faith is accompanied by doubt. It is not threatened by doubt. Second, though, if the believer can be tempted to doubt, but in a secular age, everybody is cross-pressured, it also means the unbeliever will sometimes find herself tempted to believe, will be haunted by the possibility of faith. Nobody is secure. Nobody is protected. Nobody can take their situation to be axiomatic. We can try to talk ourselves into it. There are, there are two kinds of fundamentalism. There's religious fundamentalism and there's secular fundamentalism. Both of them are trying to protect themselves and buffer themselves from the reality of this contestability. That the fact that the unbeliever, the non-believer can be tempted by faith, that is a crack in the secular. That is an opening. There are opportunities here, and our job is to punch skylights in the brass heavens of the secular to let the haunting begin. <laughs> to look for the cracks in the secular and invite our neighbors into them. 
Now, there is a second feature of secularity that I do think that we need to be honest about and grapple with, particularly for those of us who are Protestant, and it is a dynamic that is often described as one of disenchantment, the disenchantment of the world. Now, what we mean by the disenchantment of the world is this sort of metaphysical, cosmological sense that really matter is all there is, nature is all that's left, we are just meat or memes or whatever it might be. We, we are reduced to just the sort of claustrophobic imminent frame in which we find ourselves. And what happens then is we think that stuff is just stuff and it's not charged with the presence of a transcendence or a divine or an eternal. Disenchantment then does increasingly feel like the default set of assumptions of a secular age, and that is, first of all, a deep uh, antithesis to the gospel <laughs> and to Christianity, so we just need to name this, but here's where it gets really complicated. In some ways, Protestantism is kind of to blame for disenchantment. I just want us to name this. This is not a reason to not be Protestant, I, don't get me wrong. I, I'm a principled Protestant, but I think we also need to recognize that the Protestant Reformation actually played a dynamic of, in its rejection of the various kinds of superstitions, they sort of threw out the baby with the bathwater, and what happened is we sort of were part of the engine of disenchantment, which is why we then turned the church into a lecture hall, where brains on a stick learn all of these kinds of things, and the most important thing is that you know something, not that you experience the charge uh, I'm not sure why I keep pointing to this, but <laughs> this is a magical mic stand. What, what, I, what I ultimately mean to get at is the fact that Protestantism, in its valid critique of superstition, tended to drive right off the road into what, what um, Taylor calls excarnation the complete disembodiment of the faith and the flattening of a sacramental reality. And so now we're just, Christianity is a message. It's an information, a piece of information. But here's the thing. When our neighbors show signs of hungering for transcendence, I don't think it's going to be a disenchanted Protestantism that is going to wake them up. So, this has implications for what the renewal of the church looks like. This is why I want to suggest that the future of Christianity will look ancient. Now that the whole world has been disenchanted and we've been encased in this flattened nature, I expect it will be forms of re-enchanted Christianity that actually have a future. Protestant excarnation has basically ceded its business to others. Look, if, if you're just looking for a message, an inspirational idea, some sort of top-up fuel for your intellectual receptacle, there are entire cultural industries that are happy to give you that. TED Talks, Ellen, whatever, Starbucks cups, whatever. There's messages everywhere. <laughs> there are inspirational messages everywhere. But what might stop people short what might truly haunt them will be encounters with communities who have punched those skylights in our brass heaven. And it is going to be strange Christian communities. You know the, the, the motto, keep Austin weird? This is keep Christianity weird. It will draw on the wells of historic incarnate Christian worship with its even smells and bells and all its gothic strangeness that will embody a spirituality that carries the whiffs of transcendence that will be strange and that strangeness will be what's enticing. Now, I'm not making any claims that these will be large movements, but they will be the only ones that perhaps connect us to the eternal. When the thin gruel of do-it-yourself spirituality turns out to be isolating and lonely and really unable to endure crises, the spiritual but not religious crowd might find itself surprisingly open to something very different that they couldn't have imagined entertaining before. Friends, our calling in a secular age 
is less a matter of securing our status and more a matter of bearing witness to what's missing. To what Julian Barnes misses. And especially to those who are feeling the claustrophobia of this frame. We might be surprised by their response. So our posture in the face of secularism shouldn't be to rebuild fortresses in fear. Our posture should be to rebuild cathedrals of hope that are open, hospitable spaces of welcome. I want to close with a poem that captures this. Well, I'm, uh, uh, first a song lyric. Do you know Leonard Cohen's song, Anthem? Anthem. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. I want to read you a poem by my friend Jeannie Murray Walker that I think captures exactly what it feels like to be in a secular age and what our calling is. It's called Staying Power. And there's an epigraph to the poem that's an important context. It says, in appreciation of Maxim Gorky at the International Convention of Atheists, 1929. This is called Staying Power. Like Gorky, I sometimes follow my doubts outside to the yard and question the sky, longing to have the fight settled, thinking I can't go on like this. And finally I say, all right, it's improbable, all right, there is no God. And then, as if I'm focusing a magnifying glass on dry leaves, God blazes up. It's the attention maybe to what isn't there that makes the emptiness flare like a forest fire until I have to spend the afternoon dragging the hose to put the smoldering thing out. Even on ordinary days, when a friend calls, tells me they found melanoma, complains that the hospital is cold, I say, God, God, I say as my heart turns inside out. Pick up any language by the scruff of its neck, wipe its face, set it down on the lawn, and I bet it will toddle right into the God fire again, which though they say it doesn't exist can send you straight to the burn unit. Oh, we have only so many words to think with. Say God's not fire. Say anything. Say God's a phone, maybe. You know you didn't order a phone, but there it is. It rings. You don't know who it could be. You don't want to talk, so you pull out the plug. It rings. You smash it with a hammer till it bleeds, springs, and coils, and clobbery metal bits. It rings again. You pick it up, and a voice you love whispers, Hello. Friends, the mad audacity of our ambassadorship is that God sends us to be the people to whisper hello. Let's pray. Lord God, we're not always sure about your deputization of us as your ambassadors, but we trust only in the power of your spirit in the mercy and madness of your good news. And we pray that you will make us a people who know how to whisper, I love you, hello, there's good news to our neighbors when they call. We ask all of these things in the name of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. God bless you all.